So the title of my message this morning, if you're taking notes, this is a part of our Family Matters series, is Restoration in Conflict. Restoration what? In Conflict. Galatians chapter 6, starting with verse 1. Let's read together. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Well, let's, let's just stop there for a moment. What is the law of Christ defined as? The law of Christ is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So it's the law of love. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whatever you sow... Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, can we stop there for a moment? Because this passage kind of, it, it kind of frustrates me a little bit because Paul has the audacity to challenge us. And he says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to what? All people. But God, hold on a second. That guy's a jerk. Anybody with me? <laughs> Anybody here justify your attitude towards someone because of their actions? Anybody with me? But what he's saying is, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those in the church. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we pray that you just reveal your word to us. We want to grow in your word. We want to grow in the understanding of who you are, your nature, your character, your plans for our life. God, we want to increase. We want to grow. We want to be everything that you've called us to be. Lord, we want to walk in the fullness of that which you've given us by your spirit. And so we pray, open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. As we look at this passage, there's a pre-qualifier that Paul lays out before us that he actually encourages the people of God to say, look, if you're going to bring correction to people, you're going to have to resolve conflict. There's times where you're going to have to confront people. And, and let me just say this real quick. In no way is Paul telling us not to confront in no way is he telling us, hey, you know, you just got to just let people be, let them just kind of do their own thing. No, no, no. He's saying, look, we've got to confront. We've got to tell the truth in love. We've got to make sure we confront people and the issues and the sins in their life and deal with it. However, the pre-qualifier is this. He says, if you're going to do that, make sure that those who live by the Spirit, everybody say live by the Spirit, so number one, the main thing that Paul emphasizes is this, that the way we bring restoration in conflict is we've got to live by the Spirit. We've got to be filled by the Holy Spirit. We cannot try and resolve conflict and bring restoration in conflict in the flesh because I can't tell you why. Your flesh has got issues. <laughs> My flesh has got issues. And so if I try and resolve the problem and try and confront the problem and bring healing to that problem in the flesh, I lack the ability to bring full healing because I need the Holy Spirit to do that because the Holy Spirit is the one that searches hearts. I can try and assume that I know what someone's thinking, right? I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the very person who'll say, well, I just tell it like it is. The problem is I don't really know how it is. Because my eyes perceive a certain thing, but in the heart, it may be different. I may be perceiving that someone is saying something a certain way or doing something a certain way, and in my perception, 
it's hurtful and it's wrong, but we don't know truly the, the, the measure of the heart. Only the Holy Spirit does. And so there's no possible way we can bring complete restoration and complete healing without the person of the Holy Spirit in operation in our lives. So what does he say? He says this, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit, you who what? Live by the Spirit. We've got to understand the role of the Holy Spirit. It is imperative for the Holy Spirit to influence everything we do. Moms, dads, husbands, wives, church. The Holy Spirit has to be our influencer. The Holy Spirit, now I'm, I'm about to say something, and don't get upset at me, this is, this is Bible. The Holy Spirit is not harsh. The Holy Spirit is not harsh. If we don't have, now I, want you to, I want you to write this. If you can write this down, this is important. If we do not have a proper perspective of the Holy Spirit's character, we can easily allow our personality to be the driving force behind how we deal with conflict. Can I say that again? If we don't have a proper perspective of the Holy Spirit, who he is, his character, his nature, we can easily allow our personality. Anybody here ever gets your personality in the way? Easily allow our personality to be the driving force behind how we deal with conflict. Listen to this, Galatians, and we all know this, we all have this passage memorized. Galatians chapter five, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this is, this is Paul specifically speaking about the person of the Holy Spirit. There's a capital S there. The, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forgiveness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So you can't, look, you can't lash out and be like, the Holy Spirit told me to slap you. No, 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 I'm sorry, but the Holy Spirit is not destructive. The Holy Spirit's not divisive. The Holy Spirit is not harsh. You can't cuss somebody out and be like, you mother... Oh, that was the Holy Spirit. No, no, stop, stop, stop. What is this? You can't just say, pardon my French. We've got to deal with the main issue. Your French is not the problem. Your flesh is the problem. Anybody, come on, don't look at me like, you guys got really quiet, like real quick. You're like, that's to be talking about cussing in church. <laughs> See, we can really angry. We can become very harsh. But we've got to make sure we understand that the Holy Spirit, out of him, through us, is patience, is gentleness, is kindness, is goodness, is self-control. How does this work in our life? Well, if we're going to live by the Spirit, it is essential for us to realize there is a need of sensitivity, a need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Now, can I tell you, this is what's hard. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is actually a discipline. This is like a discipline because it's, there's a lot of voices going on in my head. Anybody here have voices in your head? Like, let's be real. It's like, I got, I got voices in my head. Now, these voices sometimes are of past voices that have spoken things over me or spoken to me, past situations, maybe ways that people dealt with me. And so because they dealt with me in that way, I deal with other people. And so there's these voices, there's these ideas going on in my head. And I've got to make sure I have a sensitivity to the person of the Holy Spirit to say this, wait, Holy Spirit, I want to hear your voice. I want to know what you think of what's going on. I've got to make sure that I lean into him because the voice you hear more, the voice you hear more will be the voice that leads you. And so the discipline to really cancel out all the other noises around you, all the other voices that come at you in your mind, and just say, okay, Holy Spirit, where are you at here? <laughs> i got to tune in, Holy Spirit. So there's a sensitivity that we need. 
And this is, this is what's so powerful is when we become led by the Holy Spirit in dealing with conflict in our life, dealing with people that hurt us, dealing with problems and issues, when we become sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you know what happens? He knows what is needed to bring healing to the situation. And he has a particular way of doing things. There's a, there's a moment where I already knew exactly how I was going to discipline my son. I told him, boy, get up to the room. And I was walking up those steps. I had already decided what I was going to do to discipline my child because he needed it. And as I'm walking up, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, I don't want you to deal with it this way. I want you to deal it with it that way. But see, I could already be preconditioned to deal with it a certain way because that's what I learned here or that's what I saw here or that's what happened to me. And so if I'm not careful, I'll allow my preconditions to determine how I respond instead of now I'm walking up the steps and the Holy Spirit's like, no, 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 no. I want you to do this instead. And I'll be honest with you, every step I took, I was arguing with the Holy Spirit because I knew what my son needed in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but you see, the Holy Spirit knew what would work best. The Holy Spirit knows the conversation you and your spouse need to have. The Holy Spirit knows how you need to interact with your kids. Now, I'm not against discipline. The Bible says that God disciplines those he loves. I'm not against discipline. The Bible even says, spare the rod, spoil the child. I don't have enough time to go into that. But I believe that God gave me extra cushion for a reason. <laughs> Just saying. Hear me, please. The Holy Spirit needs to be at the forefront of our decision making when it comes to resolving and bringing restoration and conflict. That means that we have to live by the Spirit, we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and we have to yield to the Holy Spirit. Everybody with me? So sometimes I, I've recommended to couples, when you start getting in that yelling that yelling moment and you start freaking out at each other and you're yelling. Now, I don't think there's any problem with having a big discussion and we get very passionate. I'm Italian. I get very passionate. I kind of pretty much talk to my wife like I preach. He's like, don't preach to me, boy. But there have been moments I've had to step back. Why? Because I'm getting in my flesh and I need to leave room for the Holy Spirit. I've got to leave room for the Holy Spirit. So number one, Paul puts an emphasis on saying, look, if we're going to resolve, if we're going to bring restoration in conflict, we've got to make sure we live by the Spirit. But the second thing he says is <laughs> to restore. Everybody say, restore. So those who live by the Spirit should restore that person. Now, if we, if we look at this, what does that mean? It means that we have to have a heart to restore. We have to have a heart to restore. Our objective is restoration. It's not condemnation. It's not to break somebody down. It's not to make them hurt. It's not to make them cry because somebody can cry and not change. Somebody can hurt and not change. The objective is restoration and reconciliation and healing. The, the, the objective is freedom. And that's why we see in Romans 8, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If Christ says, my objective is not to bring condemnation, but to bring freedom, shouldn't our objective be the same? That's our goal. So in the dealings with people, our heart should be to restore somebody. Now what's interesting is that word restore within the Greek actually means this, to completely build, watch this, this is amazing to completely build, finish, and fashion. To take something that was non-existent and to come from the very foundation to build it, to finish it completely. I'm talking completely, all the fixings, everything that is necessary. That is that word restore. It's to build completely. Now, this is, this is the challenge. If I was to ask somebody, to, to tear down that wall. I, want, I need somebody to go ahead and just tear down that wall and demo the wall. It would be very different than if I was to ask someone to build a wall if there was no wall there. 
what would be the difference? The tools they use and their approach. Completely different. If I asked somebody to tear the wall down, they'd come up with a big old sledgehammer, and the way they would approach that wall would be very different if I said, hey, I need you to build me a wall. I think too often what happens in our lives is we don't know the distinction. There is no distinction between demolition and building. And too often, we're breaking people down instead of building them up. Paul says we have to have a heart to build people to bring restoration. That has to be our heart. So how we deal with people and how we approach people is very important. Because how you approach your situation can determine the outcome. Can I tell you right now, if you approach it like, man, I just need to beat that person down. I need to humble them right now. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna demoralize this person. Because they need to be broken. You got to break them before you fix them, pastor. First of all, can I tell you, that's not your job. You know, I've, I've, realized, I've realized in my life, especially as a pastor, I've been, I've been pastoring full time for over 20 years now. And I've realized that in my life, there are things that I can say to try and bring conviction and condemnation. But there's nothing like leaving room for the Holy Spirit to do it. I've tried so many times to convince people, man, this is bad for you. You shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And, and the more I tell them, it's like it doesn't even change. But then all of a sudden in one service, they come up to me and say, hey, pastor, I just quit everything. What? What happened? Oh, while I was in service. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. It had nothing. It didn't even pertain to my sermon. And like the Holy Spirit speaking to me. So my main objective is to teach people how to hear the voice of the Lord. Everybody with me. My goal is to build people up. Is to restore, is to heal. That's why it's imperative that we get the Holy Spirit a part of our conflicts. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the ultimate builder. He's the ultimate healer. But number three, as we continue on, number one is what? Live by the Spirit. Number two is what? Have a heart to restore. And number three, are you with me? You guys still following me? He says this. Let's, let's read, read this one more time. He says this. If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person what? Gently. Now, can, can we be careful to make sure we don't misunderstand what Paul's saying? That word gentle does not mean coddle. All right? Because this is the thing. Again, if we're not careful, we'll think that we're not allowed to confront people. We're not allowed to deal with stuff. We've just got to step back and, oh, well, you know what? It's, it's okay. I don't, want to, I don't want to get in your business. <laughs> we're actually told, we're actually told within Scripture to get within the church. And this is why people, I'll be honest with you, this is why people don't like church. It's because we're instructed to get into each other's business at church. The Bible tells us that we should confront one another that we should pray for one another, that we should be accountable to one another. Accountability is a big deal in the church, but we don't want that. I don't want anybody to tell me what's up. I don't want accountability. And that's the very reason why God has established it as a responsibility within the church to be accountable to one another so that we can help each other grow. I, I was living I was living in this home and there was a room that every time I stepped into that room I would have these allergy attacks like severe allergy attacks and my skin would itch. Like what is going on here? Well, <clears throat> finally a few months go by and I am starting to get sick. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's starting to permeate the whole house. Well, so I called this guy up and I I bought a house. I think the house was like built in like 1910 or something like this. I was in college. I bought the house for $29,000. Oh, yeah. Three bedroom, two bath. What was it? 2,500 square feet. I love, thank you. Welcome to Hawaii. (laughs) Aloha. And we overprice you. Anyways, but this is the thing. Listen, listen, you hear that? I bought this house for $29,000. I got this, this, and it was a really nice house. But the problem is there's this room that was making me feel sick. So finally, I have this guy come, and he's searching the house. And he goes down to the basement, 
And the basement, which I didn't go into because I was a scaredy cat, just letting you know. I had, the owner of the house left the washer and dryer in the basement. I never used it. I always went to the, the laundry mat. Mm. That thing scared me. But I go into this room, and what happened is there's a ventilation system in the, uh, it, that, that came out of the house that would go, that was filtered into this room, and it would take air from the basement. It was really weird. And there was so much black mold in the basement. Now, look, listen, listen you got to hear me. If I looked at that guy and said, well, you know what? You just need to get out of my basement. Leave my basement alone. I would have been sick. I wouldn't be able to live in that house anymore. And a lot of us, we have these homes. We have these relationships. We have these families and marriages. We don't want anybody to touch them. But yet we're living with black mold. And there's moments where we get, into, we get into situations and problems that are destroying us. And we, we get into this, well, I don't want anybody to, I don't want anybody to tell me I can't cuss out my wife. Don't tell me that I can't slap my kids around. But what's happening is the Holy Spirit and the word of God is trying to reveal things that need to change in our lives so that we can be healthy so that we can be whole. He's trying to deal with the destructive aspects of our relationships. See, God wants to restore, but this is the thing. Do not shy away from conflict. It's how. We, everybody say, it's the how. It's the how we walk through conflict that makes all the difference. Now, this, this, this is important because what that word gentle in its original context, this is the Greek the Greek word is actually the word meekness. Meekness. Now, can I tell you the definition of meek? The definition of meek is power and authority under control. The best word picture, and this is the word picture for the word meek, it's the picture of a tamed stallion. Has incredible speed and incredible power, but it's under control. What Paul is telling us is that when we restore people, he says those who restore, those who confront, those who deal with issues, live by the Spirit, make your aim in your heart to restore them, but do it in a spirit of gentleness or meekness. That means that you have all power and you have all authority, but you're not using that power and authority to manipulate or to discourage or to frustrate. That's why the Bible tells us parents do not exasperate, fathers do not exasperate your children. You can frustrate your kids because we use our position and our power to manipulate. What does he say? He says it's having that power and that authority, but under control. James chapter 1 verse 19 says this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now listen to this. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You know what's crazy? Ephesians 4, 26 says this. In, in your anger, do not sin. How do you be angry and not sin? In your anger, do not sin. Listen to this. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're telling me that my anger and my lack of self-control in dealing with issues can give the devil a foothold in my life. That's what he's saying. So what do we have to do? We have to realize that meekness is the ability to, rec to regulate our own emotions during conflict. Meekness is the ability to regulate our own emotions during conflict conflict. That means that I can still be frustrated and angry, but I'm not out of control. The Holy Spirit's still speaking to me. I'm still listening. I'm not raging. I'm not a rage monster. You got to be careful. If you ever get in a fight with your spouse and afterwards you're like, oh, where am I? Where am I? Where am I? That's probably a problem. Don't be the Hulk, right? My secret is I'm always angry. The 
the Lord is challenging us through his word and bringing restoration to conflict. We've got a number one, live by the spirit. Number two, do what? Have a heart to restore. Number three, have a spirit of meekness. But lastly, number four, walk in humility. It's interesting because Paul says this, watch yourself. Look at that person next to you and say, watch yourself. I don't know if that's inappropriate or not. And just watch yourself. <laughs> Show what you're working with. <laughs> Listen, I, I, it's, it's, so, it's so important for us to watch the way we deal with things. But he says this, watch yourself. Watch yourself. And I, I want you to look at this. This is crazy. Look at, look at exactly what it says just in the small portion of Scripture. He says, those who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourself or you also may be tempted. What is Paul trying to bring light on? It's this. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Pride leaves you susceptible to temptation. Pride opens the door to temptation, or like we just said, a foothold of the enemy in your life. We've got to make sure, see, we can bring correction to people's lives, and, and we can tell people, hey, this is what you need to do, and this is what you got to stop doing, and, and, and we can confront people and, and all these different things. But friends, if we give room to pride, we leave our lives open that the very same thing that they're dealing with can come on you. That scares me. Friends, there's been times, I'm telling you, there's been times where I have brought correction to people and I'm looking at them going, you are ridiculous. What is wrong with you? And in that arrogance and pride, you know what was crazy? I ended up battling can I, just, can I just share this story? A guy comes up to me and says, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I'm struggling with this and this and this and this. And in my mind, I'm like, weak sauce Christian. Like, how ridiculous is this guy? Why don't you, why, I, know I've, I never said that to him, just in my heart. I like totally just looked down on the guy. And I was like, man, what is wrong with you? So I'm like, okay, well, let's pray. Lord, I just pray, help this guy. Give him strength. Jesus, just deal with him, Lord. That week, I struggled with thoughts I'd never had before. I went through situations where I was like, what is this thought? What is this thing that I'm dealing with? And then the Holy Spirit reveals to me, your pride opened a door. Oh, so I went up to my dad. I said, Dad, I need you to, <laughs> I need you to pray for me. Put your, put your Papa Paul's on my head <laughs> and pray for me. And he just, he just broke off that defilement on my life, broke that thing off. I repented, and that thing stopped. Listen to me. The thing stopped. Friends, I know what I'm talking about. Pride can open the door. So we've got to make sure that when we're dealing with conflict and we're dealing, trying to bring restoration, we've got to make sure that we do it out of a heart of humility. And can I tell you right now, did you know there are moments where my dad has corrected me and disciplined me and he did it out of a heart of frustration and an attitude of anger? Dr. Morocco. But can I tell you what was amazing? Because he understood this principle in his life. He was very quick to repent. Parents, listen, you're going to make mistakes. My dad, I remember there were moments my dad came up to me and said, son, what I disciplined you for was wrong, What was right. What I disciplined you for was right. How I disciplined you was wrong. I'm sorry, I repent. Be quick to repent. Like, it's okay, say sorry. You know how many fathers and sons I've counseled that they sit there looking at each other, well, my dad never said sorry. Well, my son was an idiot. If he wouldn't have done stupid things, then I, I wouldn't have had to. Are you, just say sorry. Yeah. Repent, be quick to repent. It's okay. As a matter of fact, can I say this? Your, your children will look up to you more if you're quick to repent. <laughs> Exemplify what it is to be humble. But this is what's amazing. Pastor D, if you come to the piano. We've got to walk in humility, 
But this is what Paul deals with. This is crazy. He says, you who are spiritual, or those who live by the flesh, by, by the spirit. Paul, what he's dealing with is he's saying, if you really think you are spiritual, approach the situation with humility. It's easy to approach these types of situations with an air of superiority. Isn't that unique when we get all spiritual or we get this revelation of God? Now we think that we have what it takes. We know what needs to be done. <laughs> right? And we get this air about us of superiority. And so now when we deal with people like, what's wrong with you? Dude, listen to me. 20 years ago, you were doing the same thing, if not worse. What's wrong with you? If God did it for you, God can do it for them. And this is the thing. Sometimes in our own spirituality, friends, please hear me. Sometimes in our own spirituality, we can have an arrogance because we forget it is only by the grace and the mercy of God that we can do anything. And we forget about how God's grace reached beyond our issues and our sufferings and our problems and our sin and reached beyond. And he manifested his grace and mercy in our life. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And sometimes we forget. You know, it's easy when you get all caught up in spirituality and how awesome you are. I, I prayed for somebody. I prophesied over someone. I laid hands on someone. I don't struggle with that anymore. Look, I'm proud of you and I thank God for you. But remember, it's only by his grace. And if we, if we continuously put his grace in front of us, it's a lot easier to walk in humility. Can I be transparent with you? I really struggle with something. I love broken people. I, I, there's like a grace that God's given me for broken, hurting people. People that struggle with certain addictions. And, and for some reason, there's just a grace God's given me. And I don't understand it. But I have a really hard time with arrogant, <laughs> arrogant entitled people. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right, let, me, let me just give you a story that happened to me just <clears throat> while I was cultivating this message. As a matter of fact, this is the reason why God gave me this message. I was sitting at a stoplight. There's a stoplight there by Coco Marina. And uh, on the right-hand side is Taco Bell. The left-hand side is the, the gas station. There's this hill like that. And I was second in line. And the problem is that light is very, very short. Very short. But the bigger problem is that there's a go-ahead on that crosswalk at the same time that that light's green that you got to turn. And so if there's anybody walking across the street, it impedes the turning to the left and you got to wait for them to cross the street before you can turn, but the light is short and there's times where I've missed that light twice because of people <laughs> crossing the street. So this one particular day, I'm sitting there, not a problem, and I look over to my left and there's this group of about eight young people standing there. They're all talking. They're goofing off. They're on their phones. They're, they're having fun. And I'm looking going, oh, my, I'm hoping. I'm hoping at the person in front of me. I'm hoping that the person in front of me, don't worry, the story has a point. I'll get there. I'm hoping the person in front of me is going to be wise and just jet it and just go and we'll get there before they cross. You know what I'm saying? Just like cut in front of them. It's like, my pastor needs Jesus. So lo and behold, the light turns green and this group of eight young people begin to cross the crosswalk and the person in front of me just sits there waiting for them to cross. So cordial, so wonderful. But this was the problem. This group of eight young people just started walking across the crosswalk like this. They even gave us a little look like, sup. And I'm telling you, it's so nonchalant, like they have no place else to go, right? Just just chilling, right? Driving like tourists at Waikiki, you know what I'm saying? Walking across the crosswalk. I'm like, Lord Jesus! I started rebuking every spirit, I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus. And I, I was just so angry. I was like stinking. Ah. And then the Holy Spirit says, what if these people... What if a person was drunk crossing the street? 
But what if someone was staggering because they were drunk? I said, oh man, I just, I'd pray for them right there. What if, what if they're on crutches? What if they're in a wheelchair? Oh, I'd pray for them, Lord. Wow. Isn't it interesting? Your self-righteousness, your issues affect your heart. And in that, the way I deal with issues, the way I deal with conflict, the way I deal with others now, are impacted. It's impacted by how I perceive people. Because I would have had great compassion if it was an elderly person. I would have had great compassion if it was somebody that was struggling with something. But because they were arrogant, punk kids, in my mind, entitled, arrogant, punk kids, in my mind, I'm thinking, I wonder how many points I would get if I did. I'm just being real. Listen, I'm being real with you. We all battle with these, these, these inner issues. But if we're going to see restoration come, if we're going to see people healed, we've got to make sure we, number one, we live by the Spirit. Number two, friends, please, please hear me. We've got to have a heart to restore people. That's the goal. Freedom, transformation, restoration. Thirdly, We've got to have a spirit. We've got to walk in a spirit of meekness. But we also have to walk in humility. Guys, let's deal with pride. It's my own self-arrogance. It's my own issues. It's my own pride that hinders me. In dealing with my children, in dealing with my spouse, in dealing with people here in the church, if we just live by the Spirit, if we make our goal, our objective to see people restored, if we walk in a spirit of meekness and walk in humility, friends, we're going to see people healed. We're going to see lives changed, but we've got to make a commitment in our families to bring restoration even in conflict. How do you see your spouse? How do you see your kids? How do you see the person sitting next to you? Because that will determine whether God can use you or not to see restoration come to the